Welcome to ATP Report. I'm your host, Barry Nussbaum. We have a wonderful special guest today. Robert Spencer is going to join us. Uh, Robert, as many of you know, is a scholar on Islam and Islamists, both domestic and international. He is the author of nearly uh, two dozen books. Uh, he's the creator and boss of Jihad Watch, and Robert has a brand new book out that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the new book is titled Rating America's Presidents. It's super relevant as we approach the election in just a few weeks' time. Uh, very important topic for today. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for coming on. It's great to be uh, here, Barry, to talk to you again. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time. So let's, let's start off. Um, I watched your interview uh, that you did for the Freedom Center the other day, and I was very intrigued by something that I remember learning about in college a zillion years ago, which is who's writing our history? Because as you make the point quite clearly, uh, history is facts, but it depends on who's writing it down and who's telling the story later. Uh, some very prominent people lately have said that, even though it may not seem true today, President Trump White might be well remembered in history and Barack Obama, maybe not so much, but as you say, History is often written by the victors, and those are the people that make the things that we remember written down in a way that they are then told and taught. Uh, I'm concerned. You make the point about leftists running academia. Who's going to write our history, and what's it going to sound like? Well, history is written by the victors, Barry, and so it depends on who wins this uh impending new civil war that looks like we're facing. The uh, left certainly understands the adage, he who controls the past controls the present and he who controls the present controls the future in a way that I don't think that patriots understand it. And consequently, they have been able to take control of the uh, academic establishment virtually with an ironclad grip such that they have written all the uh, both academic and popular histories for Americans over the last few decades and have raised up a whole generation of Americans who believe that the founding fathers were essentially racist, slave-owning, uh, hate mongers, and imperialist colonialists not to be uh, respected, not to be revered, certainly and uh, they have been taught to essentially hate their own country, hate their own history, their own heritage. And the end game is very clear. If you, if you don't like America, you're not going to fight to defend it. And if America is under attack, uh, which can come in all kinds of forms, and I think that it's unarguable that America is under attack today, you're not going to work to try to preserve, protect, and defend it. And so uh, the war for history is all important. People generally think of history as uh, dates and uh, memorizing things and dusty books and boring classes in school and so on. I hope that the last few months have wake awakened uh, Americans to the fact that history is much more than that. And particularly the left's full, uh, full out assault on our heritage, pulling down statues. First, they said they were just gonna go after the racists, the Confederates, the slave owners. And then just as President Trump predicted, they started to go after the founding fathers, Washington, Jefferson, and even abolitionists like Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant, as well as Frederick Douglass himself, all had their statues pulled down a few months ago. And it was clear that this is an attempt to ultimately destroy America and that it is all important that we fight back in this arena. And well, that let, me, we have, let me stop yeah. you there because I, I had written some notes and you are literally reading my mind uh, <laughs> as far as the next appropriate follow-on question, Robert, which is, I think what you just said is it's not just to change people's minds about history, 
but actually to disconnect people from our history with an idea in mind of destroying the fabric of what we understand America was. Yeah, and that's quite right. To create a disconnect is well put because uh, this also is an effort that's been going on for quite a long time. I can give you an example actually <clears throat> from the 1980s, a uh, long time ago now, although it seems like yesterday, and uh, I was actually for a short period teaching high school and one of the things that I taught was high school music and in the course of this I, I took uh, about half of the course actually to introduce the students to great American composers and musicians which I think have gotten generally short shrift you either learn about the classical composers or you uh, maybe learn about pop culture but very few people know about the great, there, there have been great American composers. Anyway, the point is that I was talking about the uh, great ragtime composer, Scott Joplin, who was born in Missouri in 1868, a black American. And I put up on the blackboard, Scott Joplin, American, born 1868, died 1917. You know, the usual sort of school teacher -y things. And uh, a girl in the class who was also black American said, uh, wait a minute, you're saying he was American? And I thought, what? what? What do you think he was? Swedish? He was, he, he was born in Missouri. Uh, but what she meant was because he was a black man, he was not really an American. Now that was in the 1980s. That position, that assumption has only intensified over the decades. And it's a direct result of this miseducation and uh, propaganda that's been fed to our students. Boy, and it's gotten way worse, my friend, in the last 40 years. Oh, my gosh. So Trump became very famous for his phrase, America first. And I, again, <laughs> listened to your um, speech the other day, and you talk about that as if he really hit upon something that resonated in the 2016 election cycle. Um, what do, you, what do you make of the phrase America first? And does that mean that we don't care about the world? We only care about America? What's your interpretation? This is very important, Barry. Thank you. Because America first is a phrase that has been unjustly maligned, misunderstood, misinterpreted, misrepresented. Now, part of that is not in malicious. Part of that is due to the result of unfortunate historical circumstances. For one thing, in 1939, when the war in Europe started that turned into World War II, the United States was not in it, didn't get in it until December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And from 1939 to 41, there was an America First Committee, it was called, that wanted to keep us out of the war. Now, there were arguments for keeping us out of the war, but when you have such a monstrous regime as Hitler's in Europe, then it becomes very hard to sustain that. And even worse, Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator, was involved in the America First Committee and he spoke sympathetically about Hitler. So people tended to associate the phrase America First with an irresponsible isolationism and xenophobia and even anti-Semitism. Now, there's no necessary connection at all when the president said America first, he was talking about just that, putting America and Americans before other considerations, which is something that the president of the United States, whoever he is, ought to take for granted as being one of the first things that he ought to do, that he's there for the, to, to benefit America and Americans. He's not there for the benefit of France or Saudi Arabia or any other country. Now, this also does not mean that we don't have alliances, but it does mean that the alliances need to be mutually beneficial and are not just instances of the US pouring out our money and resources on the behalf of a nation that is actively hostile in some cases, which is what we're seeing right now with Pakistan particularly, that has received billions of dollars in American aid since 9-11, and yet has been implicated multiple times, the Pakistani government that is, in jihad terror activity. 
well, that's not an alliance. And if we had an America first president, he would recon, we well, do have an America first president, but I mean, an America first president who is able to follow through with that principle all the way is going to break an alliance of that kind and strengthen our alliances with countries that are genuinely pro-American so that we are fostering each other's interests in a mutual manner. So does that mean America as America first is no longer Amer the world's policemen? We're not the boss of the world, as Trump said. I was elected president of the United States, not president of the world. Yeah. You know, that world's policeman expression, I, I remember hearing that probably from my father when I was about six, you know, and it puzzled me even then. I mean, he was presenting it as a noble thing, a great thing, that America had this tremendous responsibility in the world. But if you think about it a little bit, uh, in the formulation that Woodrow Wilson states it, to make, that we have to make the world safe for democracy, how exactly are we going to do that? How exactly are we going to police the entire world to make sure that they have good governments and that they're not bothering each other? Uh, why is that our responsibility any more than anyone else's? Obviously, if you carried that principle out to its logical conclusion, you're going to drain the resources of the United States, in many cases, for no good purpose. And I'm speaking very specifically here, for example, Somalia. In the 1990s, George H.W. Bush, the father, got us involved in Somalia. There was no conceivable national interest there. There was absolutely no benefit that would accrue to the United States for our military being involved in Somalia. And then it got even worse because when the Black Hawk incident took place and uh, one of our helicopters was downed and then the corpses were dragged through the streets and so on in Mogadishu, uh, Bill Clinton pulled our troops out right away. And I was all for the troops getting out because they shouldn't have been there in the first place. But the way he got them out was so precipitous and cowardly that Osama bin Laden noticed and said, now's the time to step up the jihad because look how the Americans cut and run when they had a little incident in Somalia. And so the whole thing was ill-conceived and had tremendously negative consequences. And I think it's exhibit A of why we are not and should not be the world's policemen. It's not our responsibility to make sure that Somalia is okay. And it is a drain on our own resources to devote any of them to doing so. Got it. Robert, tell people who are watching today how they can get in touch with you, where they can find your book and where they can keep up with all the stuff you produce. Yeah, Rating America's Presidents is at Amazon. It's at barnesandnoble.com. It should be at any uh, brick and mortar bookstore if any of those still exist. And uh, if they don't have it, ask them to order it. I know a lot of them will be terrible leftists, but uh, you might mention something like the First Amendment or something of that kind. And you're right to read whatever you want to read and that they are businessmen and your money is just as green as anybody else's. Good oh, and I'm at jihadwatch.org and Jihad Watch RS on Twitter. Perfect. And for those of you out there that haven't subscribed to our text message alert system, please take out your cell phones, type the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be automatically subscribed. You'll get all of our shows like this one with Robert Spencer for free on your cell phone, uh, absolutely no cost. And all you gotta do is look down into the palm of your hand. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Nussbaum.